praying for those who have allergies. I know your struggle, kind of, but I'll be praying for you. If you will uh, join me, turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll be reading verses 17 to 34 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting at verse 17. It says this. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we have judged ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for just how you are sovereign over the seasons in this world. Lord, as we enjoy the days of spring, let it just uh, be reminded of what spring points us to, the new life that comes out from death. And Father, how beautiful it is that when we see the flowers bloom and the trees bear leaves again, Lord, it points to your son, how when he was in the grave, he came out new. Lord, that is the promise that we have, that because of his death and his resurrection, we too, Lord, when we pass from this world, we will be resurrected and we will see you face to face. Father, that is a joy, that is a promise that we hold firm to. And so, Lord, until that day comes, Father, show us more and more what it means to be more like your Son, to enjoy your commandments, to enjoy your Scripture, Lord, and to grow in your ways. Father, I pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. So, um, if you haven't known already, right, I love children. I love babies. I love teaching kids new things, whether they're in elementary or high school or anything like that. Sure, there are, they are annoying sometimes, but I will never get tired of watching adolescents grow. Elementary, high school, middle school, all of them. Especially in the ways of the Lord. That is like one of the biggest things that keeps me going as a pastor and as a teacher is, to, is that joy that I get from seeing people, kids especially, grow in God's ways. Babies in particular are... A little bit more fun because not so much because they're adorable and i think every baby is cute right but basically because they are basically a sponge all right they soak up all this information daily all right uh because they are babies everything to them is interesting and joyful okay whether it's something falling from the you know the counter and making a noise and they like laugh because they made this huge noise right or some random person comes out to them plays peekaboo with them and they're so super excited because there's this new thing right it's new to them and so they're excited about that one thing in particular about babies 
uh, that I find interesting is that when a baby uh, discovers his or her own body part, Okay, so you would think that when you grow up and you're born, you think that you know that you have hands, you think you know that you have feet, but that's not the case when it comes to children. They actually have to discover that their hands, their own hands are their own, and that their own feet are their own. And so when they make that discovery, you know what they do? They start sucking on their thumb, they start sucking on their own feet, right? They're so amazed that they have hands and feet and so joyful that they do whatever they can do now with their newfound tools. And that's why babies are so interesting because they find joy even in the smallest things that we have taken for granted long, long time ago, all right? So keep that in mind as we go into our message today concerning the Lord's Supper, babies. Babies discovering feet and their hands, right? This is, teaches us something about the Lord's Supper. So one of the greatest um, acts of worship, I believe, that we can do in church, the most beautiful act of worship that we can do is the act of communion, the celebration of communion, the Lord's Supper. Because it is, even though it is such a simple act of taking bread and wine, it is literally the body coming together enjoying the grace mercy of God together All right? every single time I take communion with other people it is no longer about what they look like how rich they are how poor they are what do they smell like how long their hair is it is literally the body of Christ coming together enjoying the mercies remembering the work of the cross for everyone All right so alongside with other believers how great it is not only can you enjoy christ by yourself but the fact that you can enjoy christ with other people who also love christ that is a very beautiful thing to do i love it every single time we have communion so knowing the purpose of communion however can show us and explain to us why paul in our in our message today was so frustrated when he heard about how the corinthians were doing the lord's supper they were basically abusing the Lord's Supper in a way where what? Not thinking about the body or the church or even the glory of God. They were actually using and abusing the Lord's Supper for their own gain. As we saw in our passage today, there were divisions, according to Paul. And the division that Paul was talking about was simply the rich and the poor. The rich were coming in early to church. They were taking the Lord's Supper. And what were they doing? They were getting full off of the bread. They were getting full off of the food, the Lord's Supper. And not only that, they were getting drunk off of the wine. So can you imagine when we take communion on church, some people come early and they're like, oh, it's communion day. And they literally take the whole chalice and they drink it all to themselves. They get drunk off of the wine. All right? This is what was happening in the Corinthian church. All right? Choosing the best seats for themselves, eating it only to themselves, while the poor were totally ignored. They were forgotten. They went hungry. So not only were the poor unable to participate in the Lord's Supper, Paul was saying that you guys are humiliating them as well. They're being embarrassed because, look, you who are wealthy are sending out this message that the Lord's Supper is only for the wealthy. It is only for people like you who deserve the Lord's Supper. And so Paul, he shares very strong thoughts of the people who treat the poor this way. You all have homes to eat at. Why are you abusing the Lord's Supper for your own selfish gain? Do you despise the church? Is a question that he asks. Because you are. You're embarrassing the poor, and thus you're despising Christ and his church. He is saying, you have indirectly judged your brothers and sisters by ignoring them, by embarrassing them. But forgetting the fact that the kingdom of heaven and the table that we sit at when we take the Lord's Supper is for all believers, rich or poor, ugly or good looking. And this is a serious issue to the point where they were literally getting drunk off of the wine. How audacious that is. How audacious that is to come to the Lord's table that is open for all believers no matter where you come from. And yet you are selfishly taking everything for yourself. Consider verses 23 to 26. Because of this abuse, because of what you're doing right now with the Lord's Supper, 
I must remind you of what the supper is all about. So let's take a look at verses 23 and 26 again. The beauty of the Lord's Supper. Paul is reminding the Corinthians, hey, because of your abuse, you know, I can totally just condemn you and call it a day, but I'll give you a little bit more. I'm going to remind you of the Lord's Supper, of the purpose behind it, of the beauty of the worship of the communion table. He basically reminds them, what is the bread? This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, what does a cup represent? The cup with the wine. It is the blood that was shed for the new covenant that we are under, Christ. Pay close attention to verse 26 in particular. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is saying, whenever you come to the communion table, when you come to the Lord's table and you partake of the bread and the wine, you are declaring and remembering the work of Christ. You are remembering the new covenant that we are under, a covenant of simple faith in Christ alone and no more under our works. And then when you come together, you are all together as one body declaring the same message that it is Christ who died for me. This may seem like a very simple issue, does it not? I mean, this is the Lord's Supper. But just like we learned about last week with the head coverings, how there are certain things in the ways that we worship the Lord that we must take seriously. Perhaps because we don't take it seriously, things happen to us. As we have seen in our passage today, some people got sick. Some people actually even died because they were abusing the Lord's Supper that much. And so Paul is showing us here again, look, there are certain ways that the Lord's Supper should be done. There are certain ways that worship should be carried out. Why do we expect God's blessing when we worship Him according to my ways? Why is it that we, were, you know, we ask God, give us a blessing, Lord. Bless us in this way. But I still want to worship you in my way. And our passage today attests to that. People got sick. They died because of the judgment they drank upon themselves. Their stubbornness brought that judgment upon them. Paul challenges the Christians in Corinth to judge yourself. Make sure you take the effort to look into your own heart. Take the time to see what this faith means to you. Do this in remembrance of me is not just a simple phrase that we say during communion. It is a command. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember Christ. Remember what he means to you. What does the cross mean to you? What does the body being broken mean to you today? What does the blood being shed mean to you for your sins and your faith? And not only that, this is our next point for today, is this. As you reflect on your faith, as you reflect on and remember the Lord's work, do you enjoy watching other people receive that blessing from the Lord? As we think about our faith, our walks with Christ. We tend to think of it as an individual faith. We grow in God's way. We grow in His truth. We learn many things. And we consider ourselves faithful in that way, which is good. But Paul is also showing us here that in the act of the Lord's Supper, we must also take the time to consider others in our church. I believe our church in particular, KYS, I don't think we discriminate against each other because we're poor or rich. I don't think anybody has that here, right? However, the question arises of whether we come to church as an individual or as a part of the body, right? When we come to Sunday and we take communion, in the actual act of communion, do I look at my neighbor, regardless of his, his or her personality, their looks, you know, the way that they speak, their interests or hobbies or anything like, do I consider them a brother and sister in Christ 
And do I find happiness and joy when I see them also participating in communion as well? Do I enjoy watching the body of Christ grow as well? Or am I just simply caring about my blessings? Very interesting. It's not so much about the richness and the poorness. I think we're beyond that now, especially in our society today. But as a body, do we participate in communion? Do we come to church on Sunday? Do we participate in church activities? Also, finding joy in watching the body grow, receiving the blessing from Christ, whether it's in communion or in worship. Or have I ignored my brothers and sisters in Christ? Just like the rich Corinthians who ignored the poor and ate and took the blessing all upon themselves and got drunk of the wine all for themselves. Do we also sometimes think about just ourselves during the act of communion or worship or church? The Lord's table is a beautiful thing because we are sitting at this table with the king who died for us. Let us never take that for granted because it is a very beautiful thing. It's an honor to sit at the table with our king, our creator. But also, the other beautiful thing about communion is that we are sitting alongside with other sinners who also have been forgiven and we're enjoying God. We're enjoying his mercy, enjoying the grace that we have received for the forgiveness of our sins together as a church. That is why communion by itself, as simple as it is, the simple partaking of the bread and the wine, is such an amazing and beautiful thing. In our minds and our hearts, if we declare certain people unworthy of sitting at the table with us, we are humiliating them and judging them. Let us instead open our eyes to other people as we come and worship, as we glorify the Lord. This is what Paul is saying for us today. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine yourselves. The body of Christ that was broken for you. The new covenant at the cost of his blood that was given to us? Do we truly come to church with this unity in mind for the passion, with the passion of the souls of other people here? Or do we simply look at the word communion and say, oh, it is communion day. Look at the word communion itself. What does it mean? Commune with others. Community. To do things in union. And so I hope this shows us why we here at KYS take communion so seriously. This is why we always take the time to reflect on our sins, our relationships with our brothers and sisters, our relationship with the Lord. And we even challenge you all to say, if you are drinking of this, if there is a possibility that you're drinking of this in an unworthy manner, do not drink of it. Because we do not want you to drink judgment upon yourself. Christ himself said, if you come to an altar to give an offering, but things are not right with your brother, what does he say for us to do? Leave your offering there, make things right with your brother first, then return. Matthew 5, 24. Just like we discussed last week with head coverings, there are proper ways to worship. And so if we carry out communion, simply saying, look at me, I am taking communion, I am remembering Christ, I am doing all these things, and yet we still have grudges against our sister, we are still bitter against our brother, then we are drinking judgment upon ourselves. We are only thinking about ourselves. One of the main themes that we will be going over in the next couple of weeks as we go through Corinthians 11 through 14 is this theme of the body. What does it mean to be part of the body? And communion is a great way to introduce this concept of the church being one body made up of many. When I partake of this bread, I drink this wine, do I enjoy it with my brothers and sisters in Christ? 
the same forgiveness that I remember I receive, do I desire others to also enjoy in the grace and mercy that I have received. When I come to worship the Lord on the Sabbath day, especially when it comes to communion, do I do it with the corporate heart of worship? Corporate worship. Something that I'll probably be saying quite a bit in the next couple of weeks. Corporate worship. A lost trend in the church today. Like I said earlier, Many of us may come to church for individual blessing. And we may not even do it on purpose. We're not really like maliciously saying, oh, I only care about myself. But maybe because of the society, the culture that we're living in, we're just so used to individual worship that we have forgotten about corporate worship. We will pray for our friends. We will pray for our friends and family, right? But where do the majority of our prayers lie. I want you guys to consider praise time. All right? We have an awesome praise team. They practice so hard, they lead us into worship. How much of our culture influence, has influenced our standards and preferences during worship where we seek songs to satisfy our stomachs, we seek music and genres that make me feel good as opposed to body coming together, singing the same message together, glorifying God together as one body, as one voice. Can you see that? One church singing the same song as one body, worshiping God with that one voice. It doesn't matter how terrible of a singer I am. It doesn't matter how embarrassing it is for the person right next to me to hear my terrible singing voice, right? We sing because of the Lord. We sing not to impress other people. We sing because we're singing together as one body. During offering time, it's not so much about, I am giving this much. I am giving 10%. But is it a time of solemn reflection, recognizing that God has given us so much, we're simply giving back what He has already given us. When we pray, Many of our prayers can be individual prayers, which is not wrong. But when's the last time we prayed for Iran as a body? When's the last time we prayed for the persecuted church in China as a body? Corporate worship, even announcements on a Sunday service. It is not check your cell phone time. But even the act of announcements is when you are hearing of what is going on in this church, what is going on in the lives of people in this church, and you're reflecting on what that means for the body. Corporate worship. This is what Paul is trying to show us here. When you come and take communion only for yourself, you are despising the church. You're totally forgetting the purpose of the communion table. Paul is showing us here, you come to church for corporate worship. One body. You do not come, pray by yourself, sing the songs for yourself, listen for yourself. If that was the case, what is the purpose of church? We've been asking that question quite a bit, right? What is the purpose of church? I'm going to change it a little bit today by asking you, why is there a church? Why can't we just stay home? Why can't we just watch the sermon online at home? Why can't I just pray by myself? Why cannot I live an individual Christian life? Because that is not the Christian life. The Christian life is a corporate one. It is a community-oriented one. If it was not, then Christ would not have come down from heaven. There would be no need for Him to come down to live among us, to teach us how to live to eat with us, and to eventually die on the cross for us. If there is no sense of community in the Christian life, then the gift of forgiveness would simply be words from God, from heaven. That's it. Not that that would be a bad thing, 
But because of the love that God has for us, He did send His Son down to us to live among us, to teach us and to model for us how to live with each other, how to worship God together, how to love and forgive one another. Why else would He send His Son from heaven to live among us? 2 Corinthians 5.14 15 says, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Because of the love that we have received from Christ, because our old selves have died alongside with him, we no longer live for ourselves. But what does it say? It is the love of Christ that controls us. Man, the love of Christ that controls us. That is why we come to church. That is why we do communion. That is why we pray. That is why we worship. We're united in that love of Christ. Just as the baby finds joy in discovering their own body part. Let us too find and have joy in discovering other people who are also believers. Let us have joy when we meet up with other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of their income, regardless of their hairstyle, whatever they are wearing, because, hey, you are a believer in Christ. You have been forgiven. You have declared Christ as your Lord and Savior. That brings me joy. I am so happy to see you. Because we have something so important in common. So among our personal preferences, our biases, our discretions, all these things, we must look beyond those things and simply look at what Christ has done who he is that is why we are united when you guys take communion uh, for probably next next week for Easter let us remember we are sitting at the table with our king that is just an honor by itself to sit at the table of the king but when we look to our left and we look to our right, and we see others sitting beside us, enjoying the presence of the king together at the table. What an awesome, beautiful thing that is. Dear church, the day when we face God face to face in heaven, when all this stuff is over, right? And he wipes away our tears, and we're so joyful to see him. And then, down the, down the cloud over there, we see our enemy. We see a person that we don't like. I hope that the honor and the joy of being with Christ is so great. You're just so enthusiastic and happy about being with Christ that that person that you hated when you are here on this earth doesn't matter anymore. You will run up to that person and you'll say, we made it. We're with Christ now. We're going to be celebrating with Him forever. This is the mentality that I challenge you all to be with as you come to communion, Bible study, praise, worship, prayer. So enthusiastic, happy, humbled by the mercy that we have received. Lord, today, give us this day our daily bread so that we do not only eat of it ourselves, but because the bread that we have received is so good, I want to give it to other people as well. I want to eat it with them. Gladly give it to anybody who God has put in my life, whether they're ugly, poor, smelly, doesn't matter. If they want Christ, I am so happy to give it to them. Let us pray.
Father God, when I think about the greatest commandments that you have given us, love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, all your mind. And the second commandment of loving your neighbor as you love yourself, Father, the more and more I just reflect on that, to see how interconnected they are with each other, that the more we love you, we cannot help but love others more so. Father, let us be challenged when we think about worship. That because we are so amazed, we are just so shocked and mind blown about the grace that we have received. That the love that you continue to give us despite our sin and our disobedience and our rejection of you, despite all that, the grace that we have received is so amazing, Lord, that we cannot help but give it out to anybody else. That our personal preferences, that our desires of the flesh have no power in affecting or influencing how we treat other people. It is no longer about our bitterness even. It is no longer about our hurts. It is just the joy that we have in your son that is so strong that we're just so happy we're sitting at this table with other sinners, the poor, the ugly, the rejected. So Father God, let this be a challenge for us as a church as we come together every Sunday. And as we look at our neighbor that we're sitting next to, even right now, I'm just happy that I'm sitting next to them. I'm just happy that I'm at this table. That I'm willing to forgive anything. That I'm willing to love them and go beyond my comfort zone. Because, Father, of what you have done for us. Lord, we as a church, will you challenge us to continue to grow in that way? Not as a burden, but as a joy. We are, let us be so eager to share that love that has been bountifully given to us. Father, your church is a beautiful thing. And it is only beautiful because of what your son has done and what he continues to do with us. So Lord, we depend on him. Father, I pray all these things in his name. Amen. Let's stand up to sing this last song.